this could be the most boring episode of the Cajun 6 series, or you might actually find it pretty entertaining, pretty interesting. Guys, welcome back to the Cajun 6 Dynasty here. We are officially in the offseason. All of our bowl games have been played. The national championship has been won by Georgia Southern against Texas A&M, and we've got some things to cover here in this episode that just more like housekeeping, some basic off-season stuff like end-of-season stats, we've got All-Americans to look at, some award winners to look at, because really what this is painting the picture is for the night upload, so the PM upload here later tonight with the Saints draft. So I was thinking about doing a live stream draft just like in Season 1, but that one kind of went off the rails just a little bit, not as, not as structured as I had planned. But instead, I went into my Discord and I actually had a couple people that were making picks for me, doing some analysis on, on the players here from the Cajun 6 series. So I'll show you guys that whole draft plus our free agency in Saints, and that'll be later on tonight. But as far as our statistics go for the season, you guys can see this up on the board. And if you want to skip around, feel free to. I'm going to post it, uh, timestamps inside the comment section that you can go uh, take a look at it if you'd like to and kind of jump around in the video. Don't feel like you have to sit here and listen to me for the whole like 20 plus minutes that we're covering all of this information here. But just some things to note, tackles for loss leaders on each team, sacks leaders for each team. Josh Jackson is going to be a guy to watch out for inside our Saints draft class. He's one of the guys that are coming over as far as the better players of each team here in the Cajun Six. You got Tim Harris, of course. He's going to declare for the draft he's a custom guy did not play a whole lot this season William Hayes kind of supplanted him last season Hayes must have gotten hurt in order for him to take that job but Bo Sevis Jackson gonna be a, a decent player to be watching out for too he had seven touchdowns this season Vincent Scheffler only five sacks given up so we got a couple players here that I kind of like from Louisiana Tech is of course the Cajun six champions this season. Frank Enstein, we got Dio Durant, who's not going to be included in this draft class. He probably will be coming over next season. I believe he's a junior this year, but uh, should be interesting to see where these guys go. Now, based on their overall rating and just the production, the performance of a lot of these Cajun 6 teams, pretty mid, pretty mid this season. Outside of like Tulane and La Tech, Nothing really going here for, for our Cajun 6 squad. Southern, Grambling State, Louisiana, you name it. It's been pretty pretty middling, to say the least. But Donnie Doan, bright spot on this offense for the Southern Jaguars. Not really anything else to talk about here. We've got Ty Slob. He's not going to be coming over in this draft class. I've only, I'm only throwing in seniors or players that are saying that they're leaving, like upperclassmen, juniors, redshirt juniors, seniors that are declaring those guys are coming over to the draft class other guys i'm not even I, I, i'm just if you're a junior redshirt and you're not leaving i'm not even going to throw you in or your overall is too low i'm not going to throw you in so it really does depend on um how good you are like this guy like you see that jason amos he's an 84 so in madden by the rule he gets a minus 20 He's going to be a 64 cornerback in Madden, so that's it's pretty low. It's pretty low. You're going to be like a late round type draft pick here. But let's talk about Tulane as they were runners up here in the Cajun 6 conference. We had Jordan Baribault is the season receptions and season yards leader for Tulane. We had Jake Matt go crazy as well, and he's going to definitely be like a top five pick this season in Saints draft class. Other than that, I mean, they had some good defensive performances there. They got Figuerello and Daniels there with six and a half sacks each. Had some guys with some turnovers in there too. So, very good team. Tulane had a good season, but a couple losses, you know, kind of hurt their chances there. Amos and Ziegler, three interceptions each. Forgot to kind of cover that in that snapshot, but yeah. Let's talk about UL Monroe. Take a look at this. So, Ferdinand Giroux, 96 overall freshman. Guys, that's through channel points, okay? So I'm not cheesing anything up. He was a 75 when he came in, but the creator of this player applied channel points and now he's a 96 quarterback. So I can only do some. I gotta reward you guys for your channel points, right? You earned them, so you get to use them. That's how I look at it. But yeah, so Caddick was 11 touchdowns, no picks. He was on his way for a sensational senior season. Maybe even consideration for a first round caliber quarterback. like. 
that's how good that I think he was going to be putting up those stats. Now, Ferdinand Giroux didn't beat him out, right? So he never came back. Caddick was injured for the rest of the season, so it sucks. But John John Felix, did you see those numbers? 1,500 yards in his final season, 15 touchdowns. So he had a very Ben Crawford style of production there. So all around good offensive season for UL Monroe. Not so good defensively. I think that was, that was really a reason why our team was so bad. But Caddick is a 90 overall. He will be a 70 in the Saints franchise. So just a little something to think about if we're if we're thinking about taking another quarterback. I don't know if people think that Kalen Walker is the answer uh, for Jameis Winston way down the line, but something to throw in, something to consider. And now we're at the players leaving stage. We took a look at UL Monroe's players that are leaving. So just to let you know, not everybody in here who's declaring, I didn't automatically just send them over. So if it's a custom player, I'm including them. And really, when you guys had this as an open submission before the season started, I asked everybody to give me their submissions. Everybody got in. Everybody got in for season one. I have not done that for season two or season three. I don't plan on doing another open submission. If you guys want players in this, you got to either become a Patreon, a Patreon supporter, or uh, use your channel points to go buy a player. You guys can go buy players if you DM me and um, tell me what player that you want in a specific series. Anyway, the point being, some guys are custom, some guys are CPU. So I do have a cutoff here. A lot of guys in the CPU range, a lot of players that are CPU created, like uh, I believe Jason Amos or like Ziegler, for example, he is a cornerback, 82 senior, or Swain, a halfback at 83. I'm only throwing those guys in if they're customs. If you are a 99 to a 90, that's kind of my cutoff there. I'm not throwing in anybody that's lower than a 90 as far as CPU player goes. So I hope that kind of made sense. Customs, you're in no matter what, no matter what your rating is. But CPU guys, you gotta be a 99 to a 90. So like 89, 88 is kind of my cutoff. Unless you're an award winner and you're really good. So that's something else to consider. Now if you guys have been jumping around and clicking on timestamps left and right, some quarterbacks here just to take a look at because again, Maybe we take another quarterback this season. We took Kalen Walker late, I believe in like the fourth or fifth from Grambling State. So a couple guys like Ronnie Good from Boston College. Another couple players that we want to look at here like Ty Butler from Texas A&M who went to the national championship game but lost. Running back wise, again, I didn't include everybody. I just, I just, it's a lot of work, man. It's, it's 200 players that I created for season one. I went a little bit lighter this season. I think I only did 112, so I had to be very, very choosy on who got included. So a guy like Jeff Jackson, I, I remember talking about him when UL Monroe played against USC. I was really considering taking a guy like that, but um, and, uh, bringing him into the Saints franchise, but ultimately I decided against it. His, just, just his overall was just a little bit too low, so I went, I went another way. But So right now we're just looking at some overall ratings again just trying to find like this guy Joseph Harris even though he was an 80 plus player he's an 87 I did throw him in here because he's a national champion so Georgia Southern played really well in that national championship game he was a main reason for it so I threw him into the draft class so really what this is is this kind of giving you guys a glimpse at some of the players that are going to be thrown in and kind of give you a, just a better idea again not everybody made it in here so I do have like that cutoff I just talked about but yeah, so wide receivers, and it's also just kind of giving you an idea of how strong each positional group is for the draft class. Like Eugene Edwards, probably the best tight end in the entire class, coming from Clemson. Left tackle spot, pretty weak. Pretty weak this season. So I'm actually really glad that we addressed offensive line in season one's draft. Left guard, pretty powerful, I think. Center, extremely powerful. I think this is the strongest group in the entire draft class. Right guard, right guard's kind of up there for me with left guard's got some depth there to it, but you know, the tackle spots are really, really weak. We got Robbins, Watts, Campbell, all above the 90 range. Kind of the similar thing that we saw over there on the left tackle side. Ends fairly weak this season, but Josh Jackson from Louisiana is probably the, the best guy out there as a 94. He's even better than JJ Moore. You know, Kevin Bell is from Michigan State right there. So he was hurt, by the way. So he's a 92, but he was hurt. 
and uh, didn't play all season. We got Herman Houston as his 95, Taylor 95, Brewster from Oregon as a 94. The thing about Oregon is that they got two defensive tackles, Alexis Smith and Jared Brewster. So both those guys, um, they had kind of a, like, a nice little one-two punch at the DT spot. Jeff Reese from Syracuse in 95. Henry Causey, a 94 from the Texas A&M. Aggies, team that played in the Natty here but lost. Weisbecker from Iowa. And so we've got Hines, there's an upper 90s as well. Again, so right outside linebacker, kind of weak. Cornerback actually pretty deep this season. So if we're thinking about possibly taking a corner, we got Corey Hood from Oregon and Serge McAfee from Oklahoma. You guys can just see the list here. So a lot of defensive backs in that upper 80s to uh, high 90s there. So it is always a deep positional group, but especially in draft classes. So I did, I did have to consider some of those high 80s to, uh, to get included. But Zach Starks, another guy, strong safety at 93, best one of the best defensive players for Alabama this season. And of course, some of the kickers. I only included a couple kickers and punters. I don't really go all in with that. But all right, so now that we're done with that, guys, and again, this is kind of why I was saying you might want to consider hopping around because either the video is going to be really boring or it's going to be really interesting to you. So we don't have any transfer requests, but now it's time to get into some recruiting because now we're reeling it back in, guys, and we're starting to get into all the off-season talk. So ULM, because we had such a bad, bad season, look at our recruiting class, man. We are rated 125. 125. We signed one custom player that was quarterback Corey Joseph. So he wants to kind of, I mean, hey, more power to him, man. If he wants to sit behind Ferdinand Giroux, maybe he's kind of playing his cards right. He thinks that Giroux is so good, he's going to end up declaring as a junior. So he, he actually gets his freshman year back, basically, for sitting. But we have some custom signings for Grambling State. Dewey Domino, a quarterback. I'm actually really excited for Dewey Domino. You watch out for him. Uh, La Tech, you know, they, they won the Cajun 6 title. They won the conference, and they're right up there, too, with uh, ULM. You know, we, we just did not have a very good recruiting class right now. So there's still players up on the board that we could go get, but right now it looks like Louisiana, Tulane was, I think, 93rd or 94th, but we do have a nice class coming in for Louisiana. We got another player here by the name of Black, G Black. We're going to get the name for him, but he's a four-star quarterback. He loves the offense by the looks of it. And take a look here. We got a couple customs here. We got quarterback Gray, Franklin Gray, and Marquise Hendricks. So we got some big signings there for Southern. Plus, we did go after Maverick Bourgeois. So if you guys remember Darnell Bourgeois, the quarterback, well, one of his relatives. I don't know if it's his brother or if a cousin or something, but Maverick Bourgeois going out there to play wide receiver. So continuing the bourgeois legacy out there at Southern. Now, if you take a look at our recruiting class, it didn't get so bad after a while, but one player here, a custom guy by the name of Symphorian Ori and Franklin Polanco, they, they have to stay inside the Cajun Six. That's kind of the rule here for your custom guys. So Texas is not going to get Ori, and the Akron Zips are not going to get Polanco. So I'm awarding the Cajun Six team in the second place slot is going to get that player. So for Ori, it's going to be Louisiana. For Polanco, we're actually going to go get him. So the Warhawks are going to go get him. Plus, we got Lucas Bannerman Jr., custom player. Got to mention him. So we got a couple guys for the Warhawks team. So I love to see it. Now, Louisiana Tech actually, they upped their game in offseason recruiting. Grambling State had a sneaky good recruiting class. Take a look at this. They got two tackles at 66 they got some nice depth there they got Wendell Hamilton and Dewey Domino two custom guys I think they did great I think they did awesome Oliver Cloutier another custom guy going to the Raging Cajuns and I think they out of everybody by the looks of this plus a nice tackle here Henrik Egebraten I think that they might have had the best class out of the group but hey Southern got the two best customs of the group this season. Plus they got Jackson Clink too, another guy. Franklin Gray. Yep. I, I think they I think they killed it with Bourgeois and Hendricks. So a nice quarterback, wide receiver, one-two punch. Yeah, they're gonna be pretty good. Southern's gonna get back. Now Tulane also had a pretty sneaky recruiting class too, so don't ever count them out. So I think overall I, I would say Louisiana won the draft class. Southern was real close. 
Grambling got a sneaky one. La Tech, UL Monroe, I think we kind of dropped the ball just a little bit. Um, and Tulane, I think they held serve. I think they were kind of right in the middle of the pack. But overall, I think it was a good good haul for all of our Cajun Six teams. And now we're looking just a real quick, real quick glance at training results. And I, I think our defense is still going to give us problems. So what Melvin Bro, the head coach, is really trying to do is even though we've, we, were had, we had a lot of success in year one, we start off real slow in season two, brought it back. I think he reeled the guys back in. So year three is really going to be kind of a, a prove-it type of season, I think, for Melvin Bro. If uh, year one was just a fluke or if year two was a fluke. Really, we're kind of bipolar at this point. We don't really know what this UL Monroe team is going to look like. Grambling State looks like they got a lot better this season. They're kind of another middling team in year two. One thing to note here about Louisiana, they still look pretty bad. They, they don't have a lot of a lot of depth by the looks of it. So they're they're really lowly rated. And if you look at Clint Brown and Sandage, Elliot Sandage, they're both at an 81 overall. They're both pretty quick, but one was really, really productive. Really productive. And that was Clint Brown. 11 touchdowns, two picks I think it was. And Sandage, I believe, was 15 and 13. So they got a quarterback battle in the midst there at Louisiana. So whether Sandage has kind of gotten out of his head a little bit for year three, we'll have to find out. Maybe Brown wins the job back. I would kind of lean towards custom bias. I kind of want to give Sandage the, the nod there, but ultimately I'm just trying to do what's best for these schools inside of our series here because I am kind of managing them. But... It is going to be interesting. A little storyline at play, definitely. Well, let's talk about Louisiana Tech. They look real good. They look real good. They're going to get back to where they were last season, I think. It'll be a tough team. But when you think about what they lost, it's tough to say like they're going to get back to where they were when you think about what they lost. They lost a lot of leadership. They lost a lot of guys that were integral to that Cajun 6 championship. But when you think about those players' overall ratings, they weren't really that high, honestly. So the fact that most of the team got better in their stead, I think that La Tech might be a team to watch out for here. Another team, Southern, they are very, very top heavy. You see this? They got three players in the, in the 90s. They got Zeke Wallace is an 85. And I just want to check and see like what his ratings are because I think Marquise Hendricks might give him a challenge. Yes, the freshman might give an 85 overall the challenger because Zeke Wallace was not good in, in gameplay or in sim. And just looking at those numbers, he had six, I think it was 16 and 11, 16 touchdowns, 11 picks. I think Marquise Hendricks might be the answer, honestly, to get this offense moving in the right direction. But overall, you know, they, they look solid. They look a little bit better than what they were last season. So it is definitely something to watch out for here in season three. Now, something I wanted to make sure you guys noted, the progression for Tulane. So I don't have like the video for this. I, did, I was able to grab a screenshot. I don't know why I just scrolled past them. So I didn't actually cover them in the video. I wasn't recording my voice while I was doing this. So I accidentally just missed Tulane, but I did grab a screenshot, and you guys can just tell that this team is probably the best in class of the Cajun Six. Like, just look at what we've got going here. So we got Philip Maynard now that Jake Matt is gone. He's going to the pros. You got Philip Maynard, who was the starter, is now coming back to be the starter this season. You got Thomas Williams at a 93. You got Jordan Robbins is a 90 running back. Stevens 89 tight end. He's going to be a security blanket for Maynard. You got two ends, right? So Daniels and Williams on opposite sides of each other. Very good defenders. Got good offensive line. Got another left end by the name of Wade. Flash Jackson is now an 86. Defensive tackle Habsburg 85. This defense for Tulane might be what gets them back to Cajun 6 championship contention. So I'm a little nervous about Tulane. Out of everybody that we just looked at, they look like they've got the most depth, at least from this screenshot here. You don't know, really know what the drop-off is after Habsburg, but I think Tulane has got something cooking here, and they might be the team to beat this season. I know I picked them last year. I was kind of right, really. Like I picked Louisiana Tech and Tulane to be kind of the front runners. They were. 
Uh, Cajun, Cajun 6 came down to one game, which was UL Monroe against Tulane. But ultimately, we dropped the ball and um, in more ways than one. But I think this is the year for Tulane. What do you guys think in the comment section? I'm anxious to hear about what your thoughts are. All right, guys, so with that out of the way, let's now talk about the custom schedules. I will be doing this live so you guys can see. But we're going to start off with Louisiana Tech because they were the Cajun 6 Conference champions. And just so you know, we have to schedule the Cajun 6 Lone Star Challenge first. we got to schedule it first. So most of our teams are not playing in week number one. I think there are some that are playing in week one, but not, not everybody. And uh, some of our games here for that challenge are actually going to be in week like four or five, I think. I think the latest one is six. I tried to get everybody matched up for week two. Not everybody's available in week two, but... Anyway, so again, how I do this is that I match up Louisiana Tech, so they were the champs, with the top team from a season ago from the Lone Star side of things. So that way the teams, the matchups are kind of even, right? So Houston was the best team out of the Lone Star side of things. They're going to take on Louisiana Tech here. So they do get an open slot. They do get a bye week here in week three. So the cool thing for the champs is that they get nice opener on the road the Cajun 6 teams lost to the Lone Star teams I think it, I think the score was four games to two we had uh, four losses I believe but so they got kind of a little cushy schedule in all honesty I mean think about this they they get a week off to prep they get a week off after playing a tough game against Houston on the road they they go back to back here with Georgia State and Troy which should be wins for you know a good quarterback like William Hayes then they go they get a break they get two Big Ten teams, Indiana and number two, Michigan. So this is really their toughest test out of everybody. This is their toughest test. Plus, we kind of know how weak the Cajun 6 conference is at this point. I think that I think Louisiana Tech has a nice schedule to kind of get them back to, to where they experienced last year, which was champs. All right, Grambling State time. They get week one off. They'll take on Arkansas State in a home opener. And then they'll travel to SMU as part of that Lone Star Cajun 6 challenge. Take on Ball State, go on the road, Tulsa, Memphis. Then they get off, and then they get Tulane, ULM, Louisiana, Southern, off. USF as an out-of-conference game late, and then La Tech, the last game of the year. So pretty, pretty easy schedule in my opinion, but, you know, knowing where Grambling State is right now, being that kind of that middling team in the Cajun 6, this is a good schedule for them weak opponents give themselves a shot to get to a bowl game because that matters that matters as far as recruiting goes all right let's take a look at the raging cajuns here so they're going to go at north texas in week two to open up that cajun six lone star challenge then they get air force and they go on the road for two games out west so they get new mexico and tcu tcu will be a tough test for them even though they're not ranked you know this is going to be it's going to be a tough a tough sled here for for Louisiana. Maybe not so much against New Mexico, but to, uh, going on the road in Texas at TC, that, that will be tough. Temple was good last year. Louisiana taking them out at home. I don't know how I like that game. Minnesota will be tough as well. So you look at this and you're thinking, do the Raging Cajuns really have it in them to have a better season? Their strength of schedule is a minus. It's going to come down to the quarterback play, ultimately. All right, Southern Jaguars. They're going to actually open up in week two. I tried to get UTSA in week two, but they weren't available. And week one, no such luck. But they're gonna they're gonna host Boise State. I thought this was kind of just a cool matchup, you know. Just I love the color schemes. I don't know. It just seemed like a weird a weird home opener that would never happen. But <laughs> wanted to have some fun with it. So Boise State's gonna go to Southern to open this up. And don't mind the I-35 showdown, but they do have to go on the road to play. Uh, Texas San Antonio then they get off they take on Texas Tech and after kind of a rough sled of it right they take on a, a good program in Boise State gonna be tough to stop this offense of UTSA and Texas Tech then you get two weeks off to like recollect yourself and then you go play some Mac teams <laughs> like I, I just like the idea of them playing playing the Mac maybe pick up a couple W's here set yourselves up for maybe a, a Cajun 6 win or two. Pick off some W's here. I think that they'll be full eligible, I, I think, since uh, they weren't last year. It'll be good for the program. So for Tulane, they're going to test themselves. 
I think they need to. They're one of the better teams in the Cajun Six, and I think this would be a good season to kind of separate themselves. They have a chance, basically, is what I'm getting at. They have, they have a chance here to kind of separate themselves from the rest of the pack and stake their claim as the team to beat, as the, really, the representatives of the Cajun Six. So I think Tulane, if they can pick up some nice wins here against Baylor, that's not a Texas Cajun Six Lone Star Challenge thing. That's just Baylor. They're actually taking on Rice. So Rice won nine games last year, so they'll take on these guys. And it'll be a nice test for them. So they, they've got a tough, tough road here, guys. Baylor is ranked. Rice is no slouch in this file, in this safe file here. West Virginia, that's not an easy matchup. West Virginia is always a good program. Plus, they get LSU this season. LSU not ranked, but they should be. They've still got Wayne Reginald, and that guy tore them up last season. Very tough loss for Tulane. Had they won that game, I think we wouldn't even have to be dealing with tiebreakers at this point. Really, they, they would have had the... We all tied in record for Cajun 6, but Tulane would have had one less loss overall on their season. They would have won the conference. So, uh, yeah, this rivalry game is going to mean something here in week number 6. Plus, they get UCF. No slouch there. They get number 12, Utah. In week 11, so late in the season. We could play spoiler. Who knows what will happen there in week 15. But I think it's a good schedule for them. They need to test themselves. They need to kind of separate from the rest of the pack. And last but not least, we talk about ULM. And you can take a look at our schedule, guys. So I haven't done our schedule, actually. You can see it. FCS Southeast. Yep, I haven't done us yet. So we are going to do this live, actually. That's what we're going to do here. But we do play UTEP. That's the team we match up against in week number three. They were not available in week number two, so I couldn't have done this. But let's do this live, baby. So we've got a couple games here. we got some Ats in there, some Akron, some East Carolina. We're going we're gonna to swap these out. So if we're doing this live, I think that we need to challenge ourselves as well. I think a good game for us would be to go out on the road in California against Fresno State. I think that that would be kind of a cool game. We, we do need a home a home game here at some point, so let's just keep East Carolina up on the board. That'll be a kind of a cool game. So we go on the road at UTEP, on the road at Fresno, play East Carolina at home. I don't like the back-to-back -back bye weeks right there because this is kind of where recruiting is going to start to matter. So let's just open this up. Uh, we'll go Kansas there. We'll just keep doing this here. We'll open this up at week number eight. We'll play in week seven, and we will take on, we're going to host, we're going to host Tulsa. There you go. So we get, we get a home game, we get a bye week, home game, bye week. Then we open up in Cajun 6 play right there, La Tech, Grambling State. I like that. Arkansas State, we can remove. Um, maybe we play a, a, a big team, right? So we have to play against a team like. Say, let's say we go at Auburn, you know, I think that'll be a tough test for us. It's right across, the, you know, it's not too far away from us. That'll be fine. And then we will host Toledo. I love that schedule. <laughs> I love it. So two weeks off, okay, so we prep for the season. We go on the road against UTEP, on the road against Fresno. We host East Carolina, host Tulsa. Open Cajun 6 play after a bye week. Take on a tough opponent in Auburn. Late in the season, we could play spoiler against somebody. And we host Toledo. And then we finish off our schedule. So, overall, C-. minus. I think that's all right. That's good. All right, guys. So, I'm going to show you the red shirts here for my team. I'm not going to do that for the rest of Cajun 6. That's just too many teams to cover. But we did sign Chris Jackson. He's a freshman, 62. Not very fast. I don't really want to screw my custom here, Corey Joseph, so I am going to redshirt Chris Jackson, and I mean, just look at what we've got going on here, guys. We've also got a freshman redshirt, guy that redshirted last season, so quarterback is not going to be a, a focus for us for a couple seasons at all. I'm not even, I'm not even going to do it. I don't care if you're a number one recruit or not. Like, we're not we're not focused on it. we got a 99 for Nanjiru as a sophomore. We got some freshmen in the mix here behind him. We do have a good running game, though. We got Dylan Huff back as an 88, plus Billy Tomlinson as an 81. He's a sophomore. 
Brian Harris coming over as a freshman, Aaron Harwell, Anthony Garrett, 62 overall players. So these guys, these guys could see some progression, especially I think these guys are renames. They're their custom guys. So we'll have to upgrade them at some point. If you're still out there watching, definitely consider uh, upgrading your guy. Plus we got Luke Vinskov as our fullback. He actually translates over to running back pretty well. Take a look at what we've got going on here. We got some, <laughs> we've got some guys here like Houston Mason, Byron O'Brannon. These are renamed players. So these guys were already existing on the roster for ULM. You guys just renamed these players to take them over. Yeah, so you guys that are out there watching, we need to get these guys upgraded, man. You need to play in some channel points. You need to get these guys upgraded as fast as you possibly can. Plus, we got Tio Gardner, 75. Polanco, freshman, 75. Yeah, the wide receiving situation here, am I worried about it? I would say no, because Ben Crawford was like an 83, and he put up numbers in this offense. So I'm actually really impressed with Hayden White. He makes some incredible catches. He's, he is a very, very good route runner for his size at six feet and a possession type of receiver at 82 speed. I'm very impressed with him in gameplay, so I'm not really worried about him at all. I'm not really worried about Trevon Baden or Tio Gardner at all either. I think it just comes down to how are they gonna get off of press? They're 79 overall, so what what is their release rating is really what I wanna know. And how is that gonna help in sim and in gameplay when we go up against these cornerbacks and these Heisman difficulty corners, how is this all going to translate here with Ferdinand Giroux? Is he going to be able to force them open? Like, how's this all going to work? So, I'm a little, I'm a little concerned, I guess. I don't know. I'm, I'm either or on it. I, I'm 50 50. I'm either really concerned or I'm not. Because <laughs> the offense last season, we had some really good receivers John John Felix, Ben Crawford in year number one. Like, these guys put up numbers. There's no lie about that. I think it would be kind of foolish to think that the offense is not going to take a step back because we did lose some good talent there. But take a look at Houston Harris, by the way. Man. 85. He is a 99 speed, 99 agility, 99 acceleration. It's nuts. That's nuts. I didn't even do that. I didn't even do that, guys. He was just a he was a tight end that came in onto this team already. He's six foot seven. This man is six foot seven, 247, 99s. I don't know what the CPU did when he came in. I think he, he must have been a sophomore when he came in. So, you know, these were not things that I did. These were just things that were already in the game. So that's pretty crazy. I think this guy is going to be our main weapon. He should be our main weapon. We should be utilizing the tight ends a lot this season. We, we only have two on, on roster right now. And again, Luke Vinskov can play tight end as well. You, you can shift him over there. I think he's like an 81 or something. So he is better than Bannerman. But I don't want to take time away from Bannerman. I think he's going to be a really, really good player. 6'5", 235 freshman. Not as fast, but he is the better tight end, so to speak. Because if you look at his blocking, he is actually a lot better than Houston Harris is. 68, 77. You know, one's a better pass blocker than the other. You know, Basically, you swap them out, right? So Harris is a worse run blocker. Bannerman's a better run blocker. Harris better pass. You get it. But, yeah, I think uh, Bannerman's actually going to be a little bit better than Houston Harris, which is kind of scary to think about. But not this year. Not this year. Mark Keller is senior 77. Justin Henderson, 80. Andritz, custom player, 88 overall now. Um, as a senior, 81 right tackle. Defensively, we did see some progression. Vern Johnson, our best player on defense by far. But I think we're still going to run into some issues with giving up a lot of points. Like, look at our corners. Corner is definitely going to be a big need this year in recruiting. Like, that's just, it's just got to happen. Like, we can't, we can't do this. We can't do this again. This is awful. We're going to lose these guys after next season, too. So, it's still going to be bad next year because we're going to have a ton of freshmen. These guys, these sophomores, are going to be juniors, and they're going to be like, what, high 70s? It's going to be bad again, you know, but you make do. You make do. Xavier Jackson, a 71 sophomore, 83 for Robert Madison. So, yeah, what? I mean, what do you do? Cannon Walker, Arby Schmitz. Ah, 
we're, we're gonna have our work cut out for us again this season, man. We're, we're definitely not one of the better teams in the Cajun Six, but we'll hang in there. We'll hang in there. So again, this is this is gonna be my moment here. So I've basically got a week to get custom players created and start getting some gameplay here for week one action and, and all that stuff. So basically, I'm opening this up. If you guys want to buy some players to get into this series, uh, DM me, use your channel points, I'll send you a form that you can fill out to get your players submitted, and I'm I'm basically making a call to anybody that wants to donate on Patreon to get a player immediately into this into this series. So um, donations start for players at three dollars, five dollars, ten dollars, twenty, and the, the more you pay, obviously, the better your player gets. So uh, to Kind of give you an example. Ferdinand Drew was a was a twenty dollar patron player. He came in as a seventy five. He's one of the best, right? And he was upgraded through channel points. Which, again, if you continue to play that, you continue to get questions right, and continue to play week in and week out, you can get those channel points pretty easy. It's not a very tough thing to do. It just takes a little dedication and some some interest in it, and your player can be like top shelf really so just something to consider i basically got a week in order to do this and then once i get everything submitted then that's not going to open up again until the next season so we're in season three now we'll be into season four next year season three i kind of want to fly through um just so we can start getting that you know a, a nice idea of who's going to be in the next saints draft class it's going to do it guys if you like you like this thing and i will see you in the next one next saturday for gameplay and we're gonna start here with ULM with week three all the other Cajun 6 Lone Star challenge games I'll do some quick sim some quick highlights ESPN style not I'm not gonna show you every touchdown but if your custom score any big plays out there I'm gonna definitely show those but they'll be very very quick uh, to just kind of get through it but we definitely want to get some gameplay on ULM because it's really what this series is kind of about um, so yeah but I can't get gameplay until I get your custom players created, because otherwise it's not going to happen, right? So let me know. Post in the comment section below if you have any questions about the series or Patreon in general or how you get a player, and I'll be sure to answer you, or if my mods will do that as well. But I'll see you guys next Saturday. As always, thanks for watching, and peace.